and there's too much CO2. So the air quality here is not great. <laughs> so and one of the reasons for that is most likely because the, the a part of this, this HVAC system probably shuts down at six o'clock at the end of the business day. Part of it that probably doesn't. Either that or they don't have the scheduling right because all this is run through a building, a building, system, a building uh, control system. And they schedule it so if this room is, they don't know this room is occupied from six to eight, they might not run the air conditioning in this room from six to eight. So you can get a little uncomfortable. So we'll, we'll actually be able to get some feedback on that, really take a close look at it. When we look at that, and that's a big part of doing these indoor air quality surveys. Okay, I think it's working. Okay, so basically, uh, uh, there's a lot of issues involved in what's acceptable in an acceptable indoor environment, right? So there's a lot of things we're going to be looking at, everything from comfort parameters like temperature, humidity, uh, air movement, you know, you know you per your perception of the air quality is affected by all of those things. Like if we're warm and uncomfortable, if we don't feel the air moving very well, it feels stale, it'll... it'll uh, influence our perception it may not be dangerous, but it's certainly going to make us uncomfortable and it's going to make us unproductive in a lot of situations. Um, there's also situations where we can get have things that accumulate in the air that actually can be harmful, right? So, uh, and, and some people may be particularly sensitive to those. So we don't have necessarily in uh, commercial office buildings, uh, uh, in uh, residential uh, buildings that have central HVAC systems in homes. We don't necessarily always have a population of healthy people. A lot of times uh, people have respiratory issues, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of a moving target. What's an acceptable level for different things in these kind of environments? There are organizations that have uh, some standards, though. One of the major ones is ASHRAE, American Society of Heating and Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers. Uh, they have three important standards related to indoor air quality, particularly in commercial office buildings. One of them is ASHRAE Standard 62, which determines how much exchange with outside air that you need to keep people comfortable and to control odors and contaminants in indoor air. That's literally how much, how much, how much fresh air we have to get into a building as air is recirculated to keep things comfortable. Uh, we're going to be talking about that uh, quite a bit more. Um, ASHRAE 55 is another standard. Notice they, they put a dash there to put the year. Like ASHRAE 62 now is probably up to, I think, 2017 or something like that. They just leave it in 2019. They keep updating the standard. They keep moving the goalposts is really what it is. So ASHRAE 55 is thermal comfort. What's good in terms of the, uh, uh, temperature and humidity in a building? What's an acceptable level? So if I were to tell you that the acceptable level in the summertime is I think probably something like 74 to 78 degrees, 74, 74 degrees or something like that. In the winter time, the acceptable level is like 72 to 68 or something like that, probably somewhere in that range. 75, okay. Why is it different in the summer and winter? Uh, give me two good reasons why it's different in the summer and the winter. Okay, what am I wearing here? I'm wearing long sleeves. What was I wearing three weeks ago? I guarantee you, short sleeves. I hate long sleeves, right? So each way, your, your clothing your clothing changes in the wintertime, so you can tolerate lower temperatures. You don't need as much heat in the air in order to feel comfortable. In fact, you're, you're likely, you know, if it was 76 or 78 degrees in here, we probably feel, it probably is, and we feel a little bit uncomfortable, right? So that's one consideration. What's the other consideration why we keep different level, different temperatures winter and summer? economics, energy savings, right? So in the summertime, it's not practical to keep the, uh, the temperature 68 to 75 uh, when you really don't need that for comfort in the summertime. You wind up using, you wind up pulling a lot more fresh outside air, you wind up using a lot more fuel, a lot more electric and so on and so forth. Same thing in the wintertime. We have to provide more heat if we're gonna heat the building to 76 degrees instead of 68 degrees. So there's a certain amount of this is economic and, and environmental and certain part of this that is uh, related to comfort. So there's a whole, there's ASHRAE, um, uh, OSHA, OSHA PELs are hard to apply in indoor air quality situations because again, we're not dealing with healthy uh, uh, adult workers all the time. ACGIH standards, 
There's also, I don't have them here, but the World Health Organization, there's a whole bunch of organizations. They have their own standards. So maybe we'll come up with some of them for next week. Uh, we talked about the, the issues with the, uh, I left this slide in here. This slide is at least 25 years old, right? And how do I know this slide is at least 25 years old? What do you see there that'll tip you off? It, I, let me guess, it's highlighted. The carbon dioxide levels in this slide, the characteristics of outdoor air, air and being air, I'm, I'm telling you that it's mostly nitrogen. It's about 21% oxygen, but it's mostly nitrogen, a little bit of water vapor in the air, but and then there's very tiny amounts, less, that's less than 1%. Of our, um, uh, but then there's a whole bunch of trace elements and stuff like that. But it's mostly uh, nitrogen and oxygen. And but carbon dioxide makes up 350 parts per million of the air. That's fine 25 or 30 years ago. What is it now? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Probably about 410 parts per million now worldwide average, right? And you literally measure that on, you know, if you stuck a, uh, this instrument out the window, you would measure 400 parts per million. If you're down on the street, it might be higher because you've got traffic, you know, cars producing a little bit extra CO2, especially on 125th Street, there's a lot of traffic, right? What's, where's that stuff? That stuff is the stuff of global warming, you know, CO2 uh, being put into the air and accumulating in the air. So there's been, there's important changes in the air, the, the ambient outside air uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of that. How does that affect us? Well, one of the things that we use CO2 levels for is determining how good the ventilation is in this space. If we weren't here and the air conditioning was running continuously and 10% of the air was being exchanged with outside air all the time, what do you think the CO2 level would, if the CO2 level outside is 410 parts per million, what would it be in this room? Take a guess. No humans in here, nothing in here. The outside air is 410 parts per million. It's gonna be the same thing. It's gonna be 410 parts per million also, right? What was it reading, roughly? <laughs> Uh, 1300. 1300. Where did all that extra carbon dioxide come from? Right, from us. We're converting oxygen to the carbon dioxide. Normally, if we have good ventilation in this room, it'll control the level of CO2 that's building up in this room. So, so uh, the fact that we're not controlling the level of CO2 that's building up in this room means we're not controlling any other VOCs that might be entering this room off-gassing from carpeting, use of magic markers, perfumes, body odor. And, and in fact, the original standard that ASHRAE has for CO2 was based on controlling body odor, it had nothing to do with indoor air quality. 30 years ago when they set this up, it was literally based on controlling body odor, right? So you ever watch old movies? In old movies, everybody's talking about taking a, a shower on Saturday night, right? That's what people did. They didn't, they didn't bathe every day. They bathed like once or twice a week. Things have changed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Huh? yeah, most people, I guess, you know, most people, yeah, most people bathe uh, more often than once a week for sure, right? But but back in those days, odor in these buildings, when they first started converting from windowed buildings where you could just open a window and get fresh air all the time, anytime you wanted to, into these closed off sealed buildings, they had issues with, you know, they had issues controlling body odors and stuff like that. And that's where the standard came from. So the standard, while it was originally meant to control odors uh, in indoor air, now is used to also control all those other things that we're producing that are going into indoor air. So if the CO2 levels are building up, what does it tell you? It tells you you don't have very good control over all the other contaminants in the air that might be building up, cleaning chemicals, all the other materials that could be. Uh, accumulating and mixing, you know, into a soup of organics and stuff like that floating around in the air. That's why CO2 levels are such a critical measurement in most, in most, in, and you almost always wind up measuring it in the indoor air quality surveys, right? So, and that's one of the primary instruments you use because you, you can see how it varies over time as well. So carbon dioxide is important to us, right? And the ASHRAE standard defines, helps you define if you're getting enough ventilation with outside air with, by by setting a limit on the amount of CO2 in the air. So in other words, if the if it's 400 parts per million outside and it's uh, if 1,300 parts per million inside, maybe we're not getting enough ventilation with outside air. The standard roughly defines enough exchange with outside air as staying below 700 parts per million over the levels outdoors. 
that number is based on their real standard, which is how many cubic feet per minute per person we should be getting ex with, of outside air we should be getting into this space. In most, uh, in, in most kinds of facilities, it's about 20, 15 to 20 cubic feet per minute per person. That, that jives very well with keeping under 700 parts per million over outside levels of carbon dioxide. So that's really what you're using carbon dioxide levels for to see, see if you're staying within that CFM standard that Ash, ASHRAE has. The nice thing about using CO2 is you don't have to go around drilling holes and duct work and taking your pitot tube and taking 8,000 readings and stuff like that to really measure how much exchange you're getting with outside air. It's a quick way of doing it, quick, quick, cheapy, cheap way to do it. Now, what, uh, what, where, did this, uh, where did this concern about indoor air quality come from? When I was in college as an undergraduate, nuclear energy was waxing. We were getting plants built up everywhere right up until we had the disaster of Three Mile Island at the, uh, uh, the emergency of Three Mile Island about 1978, they were building uh, the nuclear plants everywhere. They used to tell me in college that by the time I got to be 30, electricity would be too, too cheap to meter. That didn't turn out to happen, I guess, right? The, unless I, you know, I get a bill every week, I'm sure you get one too. Okay, now one of the things that happened in that period, of course, is we, we ran into the issue of uh, 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 not being able to you know, uh, build much, much in the way of alternative energy sources. So we wound up using a lot of oil in order to uh, 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 heat these buildings. Coal was objectionable because coal in New York City, you have all these boilers running with coal, the air became very acidic. We had an, we had an issue in the Northeast with something that they called acid rain where literally acid gases, sulfur gases, nitrous oxide gases from giant power plants in New York, in, uh, uh, in the states uh, west of New York, prevailing ones come in this direction. We produce enormous amounts of these uh, gases from burning coal. They would come out in the rain, we'd get acidic rain and acidic rain would, would affect structures and buildings, statues and so on and so forth, uh, uh, green spaces and so on, right? So that became a real problem. So we stuck mostly with oil rather than coal, even in those days. So what happened then? Well, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries got together and they fixed the prices. They started cutting back on their production to get the price of oil to go up. And it went up dramatically, right? So uh, we literally wound up in an oil crisis. We didn't have enough oil. Um, uh, uh, because you had to heat buildings in the Northeast and we could, uh, a lot of it was allocated uh, was had to be allocated to industry, to diesel trucking, to uh, so on and so forth. So when we got when we buy oil, there's planning. In other words, for every barrel of oil, 50% of that goes to uh, making sure that uh, trucks can run. 20% uh, of that goes to make sure you, the Northeast can heat their homes. 10% uh, of it, and so on. A certain percentage of it goes to gasoline for cars. Well, we couldn't produce that much. They couldn't produce that much for, uh, for cars because they had to produce so much for uh, uh, other uh, situations. So what happened was we ended up in an oil crisis. We didn't have enough, uh, uh, we weren't producing enough gas for all the cars that were running. We literally got to the point where you couldn't buy gas. You would have like long lines. They set up a system where if you had an odd numbered uh, license plate, you can only like get gas on certain days, even number on other days and so on and so forth. So uh, a lot of uh, mechanical engineers, the ASHRAE standard in fact, changed, they keep updating as I mentioned to you, they changed to reduce the amount of outside air that buildings would be using. They, they restricted it to a very small amount. A lot of buildings were built or modified so that they could only pull in a relatively small amount of outside air uh, when they conditioned the air in their buildings. So it was very tight buildings and they tightened up the buildings. Windows went, windows went so you got these solid buildings with unopenable windows and so on and so forth. Uh, 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 we were recirculating more air and less of it was being replaced with outside air. In the meantime, we were still using materials, glues and carpeting, uh, 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 fiberboard, uh, uh, urea formaldehyde foams and stuff like that that would produce all these VOCs in these buildings that were now tight. So you literally wound up in a situation where we started to recognize, is that me? That did that, that, that you know, suddenly the sound stopped in here, right? That's the air conditioning going off, right? So at any rate, so we literally wound up in a, a situation where built, people started to get ill 
from the air quality in their buildings. So you got a lot of complaints in buildings. They, they, uh, these, the term sick building syndrome was uh, originated and that described a building where more than 20% of the occupants were complaining about the air quality. Okay, so not temperature, we're talking about the actual air quality. We also started to discover that there were really a lot of building related illnesses as well that were related to mold and uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis is also called uh, 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 humidifier fever. And it's from mold in, in, the, uh, in, condensate, in condensate pans and in humidifiers in buildings and so on and so forth, right? So indoor air quality became a real problem. So we now are at a point where we've recognized a lot of those problems. The standards have changed quite a bit. And now we still to this day though, have concern, people have learned to be concerned, learn to be aware of the quality of the air in, the, in, the, in their buildings. In 1960, if somebody, if, if somebody asked you about indoor air quality, they'd poo poo you. They would say, what are you talking about indoor air quality? What the hell is that? Well, they're smoking the cigarettes and, be, and you know, be, you know, like a, you know, like a cloud of cigarette smoke and so on and so forth. A lot, a lot of concern. Nowadays, things have changed quite a bit. So how do we understand how to take care of this kind of stuff? You know, I can't, I can't find my pen. I thought I took it out. There's a black pen here somewhere. Ah, there we go. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so let's talk about refrigeration systems. Okay, because we got, well, there's two things we need to do. We need to take that air. We need to recirculate that air as we heat it or cool it, right? So as we send air in here, the air gets warm because we've got our computers on, our bodies are adding heat to it. So that air in the summertime has to go back to our air conditioning system. Our fan, our air conditioning system has to get cooled again and brought back in here. So we're forced to recirculate air because we've got to keep it at the right temperature. In the winter time, the windows, windows and so on and so forth will get cold in here if we don't take the air send it back to the air conditioning system, and bring it back a little warmer. So we're forced to heat and to cool the air. So on the cooling side of this whole process is the basic idea of the refrigeration cycle. Okay, so here's a picture of something that would be in your window, right? Everybody recognizes that's a window unit without the cover on it, right? So there's a, there's a version of it with the, with the pictures and there you can see a whole bunch of parts on here and stuff like that. Okay. So let's take a look at what we have here. Okay, so number three, see where number three is over there? That's the part that's inside the house. There's a coil in there, right? That's called an evaporative coil. The part on the other side is outside the house. There's a coil over there also. It's called a, uh, that's called a condensing coil. That black thing labeled number two in the middle there, that's called a compressor. Okay, and a lot of air, even in buildings like this, a lot of the basics of refrigeration and cool, when I say refrigeration, I mean cooling in general, is based on how this device works. It's really the same process. Okay, so I'm gonna draw a quick picture of this. Okay. Let me get something like a right on. Here we go. Okay, let me change colors over here. I'll use black. Okay, so on the inside of the house, I mentioned that there was a coil. In air conditioning drawing, a lot of times they represent a coil as something like that. It looks like a coil. That coil really in real life is a bunch of tubes going back and forth like this, right? And it has, it pro most of the time they have aluminum fins on them like that. So when you look at the front, if you pull the filter away on your window unit, you're looking at the front of that coil and mostly what you're seeing is the fins. But if you look closely within those films is, is uh, within those fins is a copper coil that's going back and forth, right? Uh, uh, inside of there. In that coil, what happens in that coil is, is in the, in the bottom of that coil, there's a little valve in there called an expansion valve, right? I'm just gonna put EXP, expansion valve. So what's happening there is into that coil, we are metering a tiny amount of a, a hydrocarbon gas called Freon. 
Now that covers a lot of there's a lot of different kinds of freons, but most of the time they have some amount of chlorine and and uh, uh, fluorine and and hydrocarbon and carbon, right? And so, for instance, basic freon is Cl2, Fl2C, right? That's a that's that it's an ozone depleter. So now they're using alternative materials, which are H uh, uh, CFCs, right? Have a little bit more a little bit more hydrogen and a little less a little less of the other, but they're still uh, ozone depleters, not just quite as bad. But no matter which freon you use, they all have basically the same property. They evaporate at a very low temperature. They got a very low vapor pressure. If you release them into the air, they get, they're very cold, below freezing, right? So when we release that freon into this coil, it expands, it, it evaporates, it expands, and it cools that coil and the fins that are connected to it. And it comes out here. So that freon, if we put a fan in here, what happens is we can pull, there's a little fan in there, it's running continuously. We can pull air in from the room and, and take that air from the room and blow it out through that coil and cool the air. The, the air, That freon is so cold that that not only cools the air, but it also cools it so much that it condenses the moisture out of the air. So we have a little condensate pan on the bottom of that with a little tube that comes off and might go out the window. In the old days, you used to be able to, when you walked underneath one of these units, you feel the water dripping on your head. I'll explain to you in a second why that doesn't happen anymore. In a couple of minutes, why that doesn't happen anymore. So that Freon now goes in there. Over here, it's a liquid, right? It's a liquid uh, uh, Freon. Uh, it goes in here, it expands into a gas. Now that's gaseous Freon, right? That's a gas now. Now, we're, Freon costs a fortune nowadays, so we're not going to, you know, throw that away and just use just use it once. We need to turn that back into a liquid. That's what that compressor does. That compressor can be a centrifugal type device. It can be even like a piston pump, like in your car, compressing the gas, right? So that 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 compressor takes that gas and it turns it into a, it compresses it into a high pressure, but it's still a gas. So now what happens if you compress a gas? What happens to the temperature of the gas? Goes up, gets very hot. So now this goes from a cool gas to a hot gas, but it's still not a liquid, right? So, but it's under a lot of pressure at this stage because we compressed it. So it goes out to that coil on the other side, which is outside of your house. This cool air, we're coming in here. There's another coil on the outside of your window, right? And that goes, and th now that, Hot gas goes into that coil. There's a fan there also, and it's blowing out. It's taking air from outside and blowing it out over that coil. And that cooling from that air then allows that gas to condense back into a liquid. So now you have a hot, you have a liquid again, liquid freon. So the process can go on over and over again. So if I put my hand in front of the front of your window unit, what do I feel? Still cold air. If I put my hand on the outside of the window, what do I feel? Hot air, right? This is a heat pump. It's taking heat from inside the house. It's moving it outside the house. In fact, if we lived in Florida, we might actually use this as a heat pump. Now, in the summertime, this works great, right? I can get cool air, you know, I discharge the air outside and so on and so forth. Um, uh, it costs me a lot of money in electricity because compressors use a lot of energy. That's why the lights dim. When you press a click in, and 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 you hear the, you feel the lights dim, you see the lights dim and stuff like that, because that part of it is what's using most of the most of the power, not the fans themselves. Okay, so now now let me um, let me imagine something. Let's say it's the winter time, and you you want to be warm inside the house, right? So how about if we take that window unit and turn it around, so that this coil is on the outside, and this coil is on the inside. What happens now? It takes heat from outside and brings it inside. So you can use your window unit by just turning it around in the window to heat your house, right? Yeah, it, it is cold, but you wanna know something? It's cold relative to what humans perceive. In other words, 20 degrees Fahrenheit is 20 degrees plus 400 and 593 degrees, uh, 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 what is it? Um, Rankin, right? Absolute temperature is like 400, it's 500 degrees. 
even when it's as cold as can be, 50 below, there's plenty of heat outside in the air relative to the real world. Right now, of course, you're right. It's not going to work quite as good as a, on a warm day. This, this on, on a relatively mild day, when it's 40 degrees or 50 degrees, work, this will work much better than if it's 10 degrees or 10 degrees below zero, but it'll still pull heat from the outside and bring it inside. This, if, if I were to say to myself, you know, it's too much trouble to move this backwards. If I would just valve this so that I can connect a switch to the couple of valves in here, and that switch would say, hey, summer and winter, that's a heat pump down in Florida, they have them all over the place. You just turn it from heat to heat to cool. All it's doing is switching the, the coils. You know, so you, you're heating with the same air conditioning unit that you're cooling with. They don't all do that. Sometimes you'll have electric strip heating in a duct or something like that if you're really in an area that doesn't use heat very often because this gets a little bit more expensive. But that's the basis of air conditioning in many, many, many buildings. Okay, so let me show you some other forms of this. Does that make sense to you? You got a question? Yes. Is that the way the, um, the cooling and heating in the car works? You know, in the car, you can just switch from cold to heat on the same way. Yeah, that's different, though, because okay. you have plenty of heat in that. You don't need to do this in the car because you have a radiator that's got a ton of heat coming off there. So what you're doing, what happens is when you put it on heat, that hot water that's in your radiator, a little bit of it gets diverted, a little valve opens up, gets diverted to a little heating unit. So you're heating it with hot water from your radiator. And you wanna know something? Here in New York, we don't see too many heat air to air heat pumps like this. Mostly we say air conditioning units and we see systems that use some other mechanism to heat the air. Like for instance, a boiler makes hot water and you send it through pipes throughout the building and put a fan behind them. For instance, in a commercial building in your residence, they just put like, they just put them out like a radiator or something like that. So yeah, good point on that, right? But yeah, in the car, it's, it's more like a, uh, 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 you're actually using the hot water from the radiator. Okay, let me get this out of the way. Okay, so we had that. Okay, so you guys you guys have seen split units in some home, right? Those split units where the unit's hanging on the wall and you see a condenser outside of the building just like that. Well, the the condense, the compressor and the hot coil, that, that condensing coil are outside of the house and you have lines with Freon that run inside the house. So all you need is a little hole in the wall, right? To that unit, which has the evaporative coil in it. So you have the evaporative coil inside the unit, inside the house, but the compressor and the condenser are outside of the house. So what does that do for you? What's the good thing about that? What happens when you're trying to go to sleep and your window unit keeps going on and off? Makes a lot of noise. So the unit that makes all the noise and draws all the power is outside of the house. The only thing you have is a little tiny little fan in that uh, uh, with evaporative coil here and a little hole in the wall to let the uh, the condensate drip out, you know, outside of the house, right? So they have units like so a unit like that might be very common. Okay, so there's internal external units. Okay, now what about if you have a house where you have a central air conditioning system, where you have ductwork that goes throughout the house, and that unit heats and cools the house? How does that work? Well, in that case, what you have is you have you've seen these sometimes outside of the house. You have these big condensers and compressors, just like the split unit. But then the inside of the house, you have an air handler and that air handler or furnace has a fan in it and it's taking air that's from the house, pulling it into the furnace, pushing it out over a heat exchanger in the furnace uh, for heating and also over a coil, an evaporative coil that's being supplied with Freon by that condenser that's outside. So all of the air in the house is going through this furnace. Sometimes you're heating it using basically a gas heat exchanger. It's got like a radiator in it. You burn gas inside the tubes of that heat exchanger and then they get exhausted outside. But on the outside of those tubes, you, you put the home air and uh, you can heat it in the winter time. And in the summertime, you turn that part of it off 
and you just run the air conditioning. So it, you cool the air with these coils. Okay, you can even put, the nice thing about this is you have all of the air in the house that's going through the central location. So you can put a nice filter in there, really clean the air up. You can put a humidifier in there and add humidity to the air, make it more comfortable in the winter time because you'll have a spot where you can condition the air uh, entirely. Okay, here's another picture that shows kind of the same thing. This is the uh, warm air. Okay, I, I, wouldn't, I don't want to get too much into that. Okay, what about if you're in a commercial air conditioning system? You're dealing with a commercial air conditioning system in a like a building like this. Those little kind of systems, that window unit, are not practical for uh, providing cooling for giant buildings like we're in now. So how do you deal with that? Well, what you have in those cases is you have a device called an air handler. You have a point at which you can, where you have a, jo a, lot, a large fan where you can pull air from a space like this, condition it, and send it back into the space. Okay, so how's it pull air from this room? The way it pulls air from this room is this ceiling, above this ceiling, there's a space about that big above this ceiling. If we were to pop up these ceiling tiles and stick our head up there, right, we probably, number one, probably get covered with asbestos, but that's another thing entirely. How old is this building, you think? Uh, I think it's not that old, not 74. 80s? 80, yeah, probably 80s. Yeah, not as best. You can cover with other kinds of crap, right? It's not as best those floors. You, you pop up one of these ceiling tiles and you look in there, you can see almost the whole floor. But there's a ceiling of the whole floor. It's all open up there. The fan, there's an air handler located somewhere in this floor where technically there isn't, but I'll talk about that later. Uh, the, uh, there's actually one giant, there's four giant air handlers for the whole building, but uh, most buildings like this, there's an air handler for either the whole floor or part of this floor. And that ceiling area is open and it's connected either by a duct or an opening in the room where the air handler is located and where the fan is. And that fan is sucking air from that ceiling area. Okay, so that ceiling area is under a negative pressure compared to where we are now. So the air goes up either around the back by the window where the window is or through those, oh, those louvers, those grills that are in the back there. See those two grills in the back there, right? So that air is getting sucked up out of this room. In the meantime, it's going to that fan. That fan is then pushing air through ducts back to these diffusers that are over our head over here and all through the hallway and through these various uh, offices that are up here. We have diffusers all over, the, all over the floor. So we're continuously recirculating air through here. We'll talk about like what we do in terms of fresh air in a moment, but that gives us an opportunity to condition the air, to let the unit know that we're cold in here, which means heat up the air, or we're hot in here, cool off the air. So in order to do that, if you look here, yes, uh, on uh, that's called a perimeter unit. We'll get to that in a little while. That's supplemental heating and cooling, right? So in other words, we've got one system here and we got another system that's over there underneath those windows. Okay, so we have two ways that they heat and cool this space, right? So my guess, my guess is, is that uh, most of the uh, well, this is for, uh, probably part of the central unit, and that may be part of a second air handling that's separate from this. So at any rate, at any rate, so what do we, what we, what would we expect to see here? What we would expect to see in the air handler is a fan to make this whole thing work, a big one, right? And then what else would we expect to see? We would expect to see a coil to cool the air. That coil could either be using Freon. Right, it could, could be using Freon, not necessarily. We'll get to that in a second. And then you have a heating coil also. That heating coil can be using hot water that's produced in the building by a boiler, or it could be using steam that's produced in a building by the boiler. So in the ductwork, in that air handler, that device that has the fan in it, we have a cooling coil and a heating coil. So those coils are what cool or heat the air to make it comfortable in that room. And what determines which of those, uh, what, which of those is going on in this room? Thermostats. Is there one in here? There it is, there, I think. No, that's not a thermostat. There is one in here somewhere, I think. 
Maybe not. Might be out of the hallway, right? So, so we have thermostats to let it know whether we need uh, heating or cooling. A lot of issues in those systems. So a lot of differences in those systems. So here we have. Uh, this is shown as as these units and uh, as these coils in the ductwork. And in addition to that, you'll notice that the return air that's coming from the ceilings, right? It's coming up in the ceiling and returning to this unit, right? Well, there's a return air damper, right? And there's a fresh air intake here as well. So this air that's returning and going back to the fan, we can open and close louvers, which look kind of like Venetian blinds, opening and closing. We can open and close louvers so we can control how much air comes back and how much is, is spilled out of the building. In other words, we can uh, maybe only a certain percentage of it comes back and is reused and is replaced instead by fresh air, right? So fresh air, so what comes back to these coils is a mixture of fresh air and return air. Most of it's gonna be, most of it, most of the time is gonna be uh, recirculated air, but a certain percentage of it is gonna be fresh outside air. So this is a great place for us to put a bank of filters. So what do those filters do? Those filters clean the fresh air that we're pulling in from outside. And for the most part, most places, those are particulate filters. They take out dust and particles and so on and so forth. They vary in efficiency. There's an ASHRAE standard for the efficiency of filters. That was one of the other ones I didn't mention before, right? So those filters can clean the air for us as well. The fresh air that we're bringing in from outside as well as the recirculated air. That's why in most indoor environments, the level of particulates, even with crappy filters, the level of particulates that you have in the, out, in the inside air is typically lower than it is in the outside air, right? So the air in here usually, as far as particulates are concerned, are usually cleaner. I've seen facilities that, that uh, companies, for instance, that have a lot of money to spend on these kinds of systems. Name a company that has an almost limited supply of money. Name a company has almost an unlimited supply of money. Apple. A Apple. Give me another one. You're in the right ballpark. Apple doesn't have an office. They have small offices here, but nothing big. Somebody that owns a building here. A big building. <laughs> no, no, I'm thinking more in technology. Right? Uh, and J uh, JP Morgan, they, own the, they do own a building, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking Google. 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 Google owns one of the biggest buildings in New York City. It's the building across from the Chelsea Market, right? It takes up the whole square block. It's enormous across between 9th Avenue and 8th Avenue, and I think I think 15th Street and 16th Street. It's an enormous building. They have they have a, 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 an air conditioning system in that building for their floors where their workers are, which include HEPA filters for particulate filters, which include. Uh, 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 activated eight inch deep activated charcoal filters to take out VOCs as well. They can afford it. So they have like really high end. So you can do all sorts of stuff with filters and stuff like that. You're going to go from that or you can go from go to those little blue filters. You hold them up and you can read a newspaper through them. You've seen those, right? They're not very efficient, but they're something. You keep recirculating the air. They do take some air, uh, some dirt out of the air. So this is a this is typical of these kinds of units. You need a filter, you need some sort of device, a coil to cool the air, and you need some sort of coil to heat the air, and you need a fan to keep it running. And then you also need some mechanism for throwing all the air out and pulling some fresh air in. And they all do these basics. They all take care of that in one form or another. Okay, so I'll have to come back to that in a second. So here's a, here's a few other examples of this. For instance, now here is a system where you have, now what do we have here? We have air handlers on each one of these floors, right? Where we have a, a, a cooling coil and a heating coil in each one of these boxes and a fan. Uh, and each one of these has a connection to a duct which brings air in from the outside so we can get outside, fresh outside air into these units uh, in proportion to the amount of recirculating air that we have. So each one of these units takes the air, either heats it or cools it, sends it to a bunch of diffusers that are distributed ducts that go out through the floor, and they branch out into a main duct, 
and then into trees, like another branches out, and then trees and so on and so forth, goes to all these diffusers that are here. And the ductwork gets smaller and smaller as so it goes to each one of them. Okay, so, and some of these systems, they just have the ductwork go out to the individual diffusers, right? And uh, uh, the individual diffusers all have the same amount of air coming out of them. And the fans on these systems run constantly, right? They just run all the time. And there's a thermostat, single thermostat on the whole floor, which determines the average temperature on that floor, right? So you get a couple of people complain it's cold over here, too hot over here, but not too much you can do about that because a single thermostat controls the whole floor or maybe the whole east side of the floor, the whole north side of the floor or something like that. That's called a constant volume system. The fan runs the same speed all the time. More modern buildings, they take that fret, that ductwork, that air that's coming into the, that, that is being distributed around the building and they send it to a terminal unit or what they call a, uh, 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 I'm having a senior moment here. Uh, I'll just call it for a moment, I'll call it a terminal unit, a, a variable air uh, volume box. Right, that ver that box, that terminal unit, is connected. May serve only maybe one diffuser or three diffusers or two diffusers, maybe two offices. Right, side by side, each one of those each one of those little groups has shares a thermostat. So, for instance, if there was a thermostat in this room and we had a terminal unit supplying this room, we could adjust the temperature to whatever we wanted to, and we would only get the amount of cold air or hot air that we needed to keep this room perfect. We wouldn't have to worry about whether the guy next door is cold or hot, right? So that's called a variable air volume system. How does that work? Well, if that thermostat is satisfied, it only brings a little bit of cold air into this room in the, in the summertime. If, that air, if it's not satisfied, it opens up a, a damper and it lets a lot more air, cold air come into this room. So basically what will happen is the amount of air coming out of that diffuser varies. It's always the same temperature, but the amount varies all the time, right? That's called a variable air volume system. It's a giveaway. If you see thermostats every couple of offices, you know it's a variable air volume system. That you have some sort of box that controls the air. If you only see one thermostat on the floor, it means that it's a constant volume system. Only one thing controlling that uh, the whole time. So they have coils in there, right? Well, gee, you know, the problem with what Freon is, is that when you're sending it through these tubes, these tubes cannot, they have to be insulated. They can't be too long. The Freon can, can condense in them and they can do weird things and, and it, it doesn't turn out very efficient. So it's a real problem to have Freon lines running throughout a building. Very expensive, they're very, that's under a lot of pressure and so on and so forth. If they leak, it costs a fortune. So it's a problem. So instead of putting a Freon coil for cooling in each one of these air handlers, let's put a machine in the basement, which has an evaporative coil and a condensing coil in it, right? Except we're gonna put those, those coils, we're gonna put them into big metal cylinders. So instead of blowing air over them, we run water through that cylinder over the coil. So what happens to the evaporative coil? It cools the water. So now we take that cold water, it's usually cold about 45 degrees. We take that cold water and we pump it throughout the building to each one of these air handlers. So now we're blowing the air over a coil called the chilled water coil. And what about for heat? Well, for heat, we put a boiler in the building, make hot water, and we pump that water to another coil in each one of those uh, air handlers. And we call that a hot water coil. Sometimes we use steam, a lot of times in a building like this, They'll use hot water. Sometimes only we use one coil. And in the summertime, they'll put cold water through that coil. And in the wintertime, they'll put hot water through that same coil. That's called a dual temperature coil, right? So instead of pumping Freon all over the place, you're pumping hot water and cold water. The cold water is made in a unit called a chiller, right? Which chills water. And it does it the same way that you would cool your room uh, when you were working with, uh, when we were concerned about uh, 
uh, our window unit, right? It's got the same kind of coil in it. It's good using Freon, except you're, blow, you're running water over that coil instead of uh, blowing air past it. Now you got to take the heat away from that, right? So now how do you take the heat away from that? Well, you know, some of these units, they actually use a, a big giant banks of coils that they blow air over. That's called an air-cooled condenser. You'll see them on roofs some, sometimes. But when they're really large machines, that's not practical. You have to have so much, so much space used up for these coils, it's not practical. So in order to take the heat away from the Freon, instead of blowing air over it, they run water over it. So you put water in there, comes in, comes in cold, comes out hot. What do you do with that water now? Anybody want to speculate on what you do with that water now? You throw it away? You recycle it, right? But you can't use it because it's hot now, right? It doesn't work very efficiently. You need to cool it before you can reuse it. That's where cooling towers come in. You take that hot water that's taking the heat away from your Freon, it goes into your machine at 85 degrees roughly. It comes out of your machine at about 95 or 100 degrees. You need it at 85 degrees again. How are you going to do that? Well, the way that you do that is you send it to a cooling tower. I'll come back to those. Hopefully, I got pictures of cooling towers here. I dumped there, was, there was one. There was one. On the picture you have. Yeah, yeah this guy, I was hoping for a better one than that, but that's okay. We'll get the one anyway. Okay, let me go back here. There it is at the roof, right? What is a cooling tower? Cooling tower is really pretty simple. Cooling tower is a big, giant box. Like an air handler, so it's a it's a steel box, and it's got a fan on the top of it. Here, this one has a fan on the top. Sometimes I have them on the side. This one has it on the top, and it has a series of spray trees in it. So what happens is is that you take that hot water and you spray it down down into this cooling tower, right from the top. You're spraying it down. There's pipes going in there. You spray it down at the same time that you have these fans running. And you have you're pulling air through that sprayed water. Well, if you pull air through water, uh, through droplets of water, what happens to the water? Some of it's going to evaporate, right? Yeah, you cool it. Some of it is sensible cooling, like it's just the air, cool air hitting it and stuff like that. But most of the cooling comes from evaporation. So when you send that water up to that cooling tower, 99% of that water comes back at 85 degrees. 1% of that water evaporates away, and that's what cools the rest of the water about that 10 or 15 degrees that you need. So that water comes back from that cooling tower at 85 degrees so you can reuse it again. So, but the only problem is now you've lost that water. So inside these cooling towers have makeups, they run continuously. The whole time the cooling tower is running, you're putting water into this cooling tower, but you're not throwing away, you're only throwing away 1% of the water not 100% of the water in order to get so you can reuse it. Well, that's great, except that you're blowing air through that water, and that water that's spraying down is scrubbing organic material, bugs, pigeons, uh, uh, pollen, mold, out of the air into your cooling tower water. And it's also oxygenic. So you got you to deal with that water. You have to use chemicals to, to inhibit corrosion. You have to... Uh, use chemicals that keep it from scaling up and rusting up and stuff like that. But especially you have an issue that you start, you can get algae growing in there. And if you get algae growing in there, the algae can break off and clog up all these pumps and strainers and stuff that you have in this system really mess things up, right? What else can you get growing in there? What temperatures did I mention to you? I mentioned something like 85 to 100 degrees. What bacteria loves that temperature? Legionella, right? Legionella pneumophila loves that temperature. That's an ideal, I think the ideal range for its growth is somewhere between 85 and 115 degrees. Perfect growth mechanism for Legionella. And not only is it a perfect mechanism for growing Legionella, it's a perfect mechanism for distributing Legionella. Why is that? Because you're spraying water and you're blowing air across the water. So what's going to happen inevitably to some of those droplets of water? They're going to get pulled, blown out of the cooling tower. Now, there's mechanisms in there called drift eliminators that are supposed to re greatly reduce the amount of droplets that you blow out of the cooling tower, but they don't eliminate it. So it gets blown out of the cooling tower into the air. Where do those droplets go? Into the 
right? You ever walking along the street there, you feel stuff hit you in the head and stuff like that. You look around, it's raining here, right? They go out to the air and those droplets can contain bacteria, mold. They can even control, contain uh, Legionella, right? That's why in New York City, we have very rig rigorous requirements for treating these cooling towers to control Legionella in the cooling towers. We still get an occasional outbreak though. Right, the most, the biggest one we got was in, in in 2015 in the Bronx, where a cooling tower infected, a, I think, two or three hundred people, and I think there was something like 15 or 20 deaths, fatalities, associated with uh, with that outbreak. Okay, and and you know, there's a certain group of people that are susceptible: cardiovascular disease, uh, pulmonary function issues, elderly uh, uh, smokers are disproportionately affected by this, but you also get some young, healthy people occasionally that are affected, and it's a nasty disease. What is it really? What, what is uh, Legionnaire's disease really? It's a lung disease, right? It's pneumonia. It's basically just a bacterial pneumonia. It just happens to be a particularly virulent bacteria that's, that causes it. If they catch it early, they have antibiotics that are pretty effective against it, but they have to recognize it, right? They have to recognize before the infection gets really bad that it's Legionnaire's disease and that you need to be treated by these specific uh, uh, bacteria. And so, so you, you know, you get a very high temperature and you think you have pneumonia, it's a good idea to get checked out. Okay, so, so, uh, so yeah, that, so, Legion, so that's one of the issues here with, uh, and that's a building related illness, right? Because it's associated with the air conditioning system. So what would you say is one of the important things about where you locate a cooling tower in a building? Where do you not want to put a cooling tower? Oh, no, not the basement so much, but yeah, you want your basement's bad spot for it. I'll tell you why in a second. But no, in general, what, what's the one spot that you don't want to put it next to? Remember our duct work there, our exhaust duct? You don't want it near the fresh air intake. If it's near the fresh air intake, anything that's in that those droplets can get sucked into the building. In fact, they have, they have cooling towers. They had a Ford, uh, a Ford plant where people in the buildings became ill because the cooling tower was, was infected with a high, level, a high amount of Legionnaire's uh, uh, bacteria and the discharge from the cooling tower was getting sucked into the fresh air intake and infecting people in the building, right? So you wanna make sure it's not close to the fresh air intake or openable windows, right? Anything that would wind up exposing people unnecessarily to it right so we, we got a way a lot of ways that these building that these systems work now when we look inside these air handlers one of the things that when we that we do when we do an indoor air quality survey is we'll look michael go in there and say gee uh, let me take a look inside your air handler well, why do we want to take a look inside the air handler we want to see if the if the filters are, uh, are in good shape we want to see if the coils are clean we want to see if there's mold growing we want to see if the condensate's draining properly. Is there slime growing in there? What's the inside of this area look like? Is it sanitary, right? Here's a couple of pictures of, uh, of uh, condensate pants in, uh, in typical air handling. You've seen stuff like this, right? So here, here's, uh, there's all sorts of slime and nasty stuff growing in this one. This one's super corroded, right? But those, those are, lit that's literally a uh, cooling coil. This is a, a cooling coil in a larger unit. Okay, so I get into these bigger buildings and these systems get more and more and more elaborate. Here's a, uh, 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 here's a typical supply and return system for a large HVAC system in a commercial office building. Each floor, each, oops, each one of these floors has uh, its, uh, uh, well, this, in this case, they have uh, uh, rooftop air handling units. They have ducts that go down and supply air to three floors below it. And from there, air is ducted throughout the three floors and then is returned to the air handling units on the roof. So each air, each air handler there serves one floor. Exactly, that's, a, yeah, it, yeah, appears that way, yeah. So if you're, if you're looking at systems for air quality and you have like a problem area, want to know which air handler is serving that problem area so that you can take a look at it. Sometimes you can go to a building with like 20 air handlers. You know, you don't want to look at all of them. 20? 120 Broadway probably has about a couple of hundred. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, there were some buildings have an immense number of air handlers in them, depending on when they were built. A lot of buildings weren't built with air conditioning. But air conditioning only been around in the city since like, mid 30s or something like that, late 30s. One of the first buildings to have air conditioning in New York City was Macy's department store. They had, they put in a system. Uh, Macy's put in a system uh, uh, in the department store. They're one of the first places for their eight sales floors. You know, Macy's is the builds itself as the biggest department store in the world, right? So enormous amounts of floor space. The first eight floors are sales floors. They also have a tower that goes up higher where most of their offices and stuff, and stuff are. Those eight floors were, were among the first places in New York City to have central air conditioning. The original system up until about the 70s, the, uh, up until about uh, maybe a little late, like early 80s, had a system where they made chilled water in the basement. They had a tank where they stored the chilled water, 50,000 gallon tank where they stored the chilled water. That chilled water was then uh, piped to air handlers on each of the eight floors. And those air handlers did not have coils in them. They would take that chilled water, spray it in the booth, and blow the room air past, the floor air, past that spray of cooled water. So it served as much as, as an air cleaner and a air conditioning system, both. And uh, they had an outbreak of Legionnaires disease in the garment district that was tied to one of the cooling towers in, at Macy's. Uh, and they decided that it didn't come from one of those air handlers, because remember, they operate at very low temperatures, not a great growth medium for Legionella, but they decided it was too risky to have them anyway. They replaced them all with coils over the course of a couple of years. But they literally had one of the first air conditioning systems in New York. They made, they did not have motor-driven compressors. They, they used a compressor that was driven by a turbine. They, in fact, had three turbines. They had a turbine, they had boilers, their own boilers. They didn't use city steam back in those days. They had their own boilers. The boilers were high pressure boilers. They had a staff of like 30 or 40 engineers that worked around the clock that would run, uh, run high pressure steam boilers in their basement, spin a high speed turbine, uh, uh, like 375 uh, PSI turbine comes out with steam at up 250 PSI. These are dangerous machines. Right, that's why they have to have licensed engineers running them. And then they have a second one, a lower range, like 250 to 150, and then a third one, uh, 250 to 75 PSI, and then they would condense whatever steam was left and reuse it and so on, right? And they would run these, these three steam turbines to compress the Freon that they needed to cool the water that they were making their chilled water from. When the war broke out, the government for a GE plant upstate New York commandeered their turbines, put them on barges, shipped them upstate New York for, during the course of World War II, used them at the GE plant until the end of the war, put them on a bar, put them on three separate barges, shipped them back to Macy's. One of them sank in the Hudson River. They recovered it, and all three of them were back at Macy's within a year and operating for air conditioning again, right? Wait. Is that amazing? Okay. Yes? They, they used the one that yeah, they cleaned it up. It's they're just big, yeah, they have expensive machines. Yeah, so they, they don't want to, you know, give them up. They just clean them up and reuse them. Right. They, they're not they're non-porous, they're steel, right? They can clean them up and use them again. Right. So I'm sure they recovered them pretty quickly. Plus, if they if they sank in freshwater portion of the river, you know, that's a lot less of an issue than if they sank in. I'm sure they had any electronics that was unrecoverable. You know, but certainly the portions of it that uh, spun the generators and stuff like that was certainly uh, uh, recoverable. So nowadays those machines are gone and, and they operate these other machines don't require licensed engineers and their engineering staff went from 40 people to like two or three people. They have pictures of their, their annual engineering department picnic, hundreds of people there with the families and stuff like that. And now there's, you know, there's hardly anybody left. But anyway, yeah, that's how these systems go. They're, they're automated. At a, at a, now, this building has a very interesting system, Michelle. 
tell you about in a second. So I, I think that at least is enough to give you a taste of how these HVA systems operate. I'll try and bring in some, some more pictures of some of them. Uh, so you get like a little bit better idea of what they actually look like. It would be great maybe if we could get a, uh, 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 a look at the HVAC system in this building. This building uses a system called an absorber where you use steam to produce cooling, right? Not a steam turbine, but you use direct steam to produce cooling. So, which is really interesting process. I mean, maybe I'll get a chance to talk about it. Mike, you want to give them a little bit more of your indoor air quality uh, stuff, your surveys? So now that you know kind of like how these systems work, hopefully that'll, that'll it'll make a little bit more sense to you uh, what it looks like when you actually go in and investigate an indoor air quality problem. 